So I ran across a article this week. Um, I think that my good friend Preston sent it to me. And it is remarkable. Not surprising at all. And I wanted to pass it along to you. We'll link to it in the show notes. It's an article from The Atlantic written by Laura Acknan, Jamil Zaki, and Elizabeth Dunn. I'm confident that I just misspelled those names. They are researchers at various universities. Um, Stanford, Simon Fraser, um, others. Listen. All right, here's the deal. I'm going to start giving... Kelly, five dollars every time I say the word "listen" because I just said it again. Five bucks. I'm all for that. Effective immediately. Just come Great. in over the thing and let us all know. Perfect. All right, not you, Ben. Just kidding. I'll pay. Can you, you give too. me five dollars too? Nick, I'll, everybody in the booth. Five dollars for you. Five dollars for you. Everybody. Sweet. Thanks, Oprah. Here's the. <laughs> all right. The name of the article is "The Pandemic Did Not Affect Mental Health in the Way You Think." So, like me, I did it. Every mental health professional I knew when the pandemic set off, we all just looked at the alleged death toll, the fear mongering, the true and real fear, the lockdown, the isolation, the economic disaster, the coming economic disaster, the phrase, the looming or the coming, fill in the blank, right? Whatever it was. And early on, we saw devastating anxiety numbers, depression numbers, financial numbers. It was distress was just climbing through the roof. These researchers say it climbed dramatically, right, all over the world. And I'm going to read here. But as spring turned to summer, something remarkable happened. Average levels of depression, this is in 2020, and distress begin to fall. Some data sets even suggested that overall psychological distress returned to pre-pandemic levels by early summer 2020. Looking at the world as a whole, we saw no trace of a decline in life satisfaction. People in 2020 rated their lives at a 5.75 on average, identical to the average in previous years. So what does this mean? It's a, a story as old as time, and it's, it's based in neuroscience, which is our brains have a vested interest in looking for the worst case scenario and then trying to reverse engineer that so that we don't die. Our brains have a vested interest in saying, yeah, but this might happen, and so we need to be careful about the might, the could be, the maybes. And that is why we can't stop scrolling. That's why we can't stop watching news headlines that have disaster or looming or crisis in the titles. That's why we can't stop watching the stock market tick up and down and down and up and up and down and down and up and up and down. The, the last time I, I saw the market a few weeks ago, it was uh, it's, it's up some insane number. But it talked about, oh, it's down 100 points because of... It was 100 points down that day after being 10,000 points up over the last few years. I mean, it's just madness, right? But our brains are so hardwired to look for the next hole in the ground, the next thing that might jump out behind a tree and eat us. But the tale as old as time is we are incredibly resilient. We can overcome, adapt to, solve for so many things. And as the authors write, the pandemic has been a test of the global psychological immune system, which appears more robust than we ever could have guessed. When familiar sources of enjoyment evaporated in the spring of 2020, people got creative. They participated in drive-by birthday parties, mutually assisted groups, virtual cocktail evenings with old friends, and nightly cheers for healthcare workers. Some people got really good at baking. Many found a way to reweave their social tapestry. Indeed, across multiple large data sets, levels of loneliness showed only a modest increase with 13.8% of adults in the U.S. compared with 11% in spring 2018. People are incredible. Now, here's the thing. There was deep, disastrous real pain. Hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people have died of COVID alone in the United States. Conspiracy theories aside, 
lots and lots and lots of people have suffered loss and death, plus car wrecks, plus lost jobs, plus terrifying financial conditions, all of it. But here what the author is going to write. The astonishing resilience that most people have exhibited in the face of the sudden changes brought on by the pandemic hold its own lessons. We learned that people can handle temporary changes to their lifestyle, such as working from home, giving up travel, or even going into isolation, better than some policymakers seem to as- seemed to assume. And here's why this is super, super important. We've got big-time challenges on the horizon. Big time challenges, whether they be financial, whether they be ecological, whether they be political, whether they be psychological, whether they be whatever. Here's what the authors write. Human beings are not passive victims of change, but active stewards of our own well-being. This knowledge should empower us to make the disruptive changes our societies may require, even as we support the individuals and communities that have been hit the hardest. What does that mean? That means that we as a society, as a group, as individuals are hardwired to be terrified of change. Terrified of it. So scared. And yet, after what has been one of the most difficult and challenging crises, I don't think it's over by a long shot. Most difficult crisis many of us have faced in our lifetimes collectively. Our brains are solving for it. Our relationships are solving for it. We are figuring out other ways. We are getting creative. We are getting frustrated. We are charting new paths. We are slowly recalibrating relationships. We are getting rid of stuff that we've been carrying around us for a long time. We are deciding we are going to make changes in our lives. And our bodies are saying, cool, we're safe now. And so if you've got hard changes to make, whether like today's calls, whether it's Lorraine saying, I want to stop hurting people. I want to stop being so exhausted all the time. I want to stop being judge and jury. Or whether it's like Chris who, who wants to stop judging people who have less than him or wants to stop feeling guilty about being successful in his new job, his new enterprise. Or it's you, you want to stop an addiction. You want to... Get control of your health. Be good stewards of your mental health. Learn how to have relationships and get connected. Learn how to change your thoughts. Learn how to start acting differently. You can. You can. This pandemic has been disastrous for many of us. Millions and millions of worldwide. But it's also shown us a glimpse of light through the cracks. We are strong and we are resilient, especially when we figure things out together. So we'll link to that in the show notes if you want to read it. It's a really remarkable read. And again, just a little bit of light at the end of the tunnel for some of us. <laughs>